welcome everybody to this presentation on the chemistry of foods part 2 in the first part we discussed about the macronutrients carbohydrates proteins and fats in this lecture we are going to talk about micronutrients and as we have seen in the last lecture that the food must contain all the essential nutrients which includes both macronutrients and micronutrients so as to maintain a healthy body and also for maintenance and growth of the body what are micronutrients as we have seen earlier that micronutrients are called micronutrients because the body needs only very small quantities of these for survival they are necessary for the healthy functioning of all the body systems from bone growth to brain function however if the body doesn't get the required quantities of micronutrients serious health problems can result and we have seen that the micro nutrients include a large number of metals and also all the vitamins because the body does not synthesize its own vitamins these together are labeled as micro nutrients first let's talk about uh, the vitamins one of the first discoveries of the importance of vitamins came in 1700s a scottish doctor james lynn discovered that sailors who were fed on citrus fruits recovered from scurvy today health scientists know that scurvy is caused by lack of vitamin c which is found in abundance in citrus fruits in fact vitamins do not supply energy however some vitamins do function as coenzymes in the release of energy from carbohydrates proteins and fats some vitamins are available from foods in inactive forms known as precursor and once inside the body these precursors are then converted into the active forms of the enzyme of the vitamin the deficiency of vitamin causes specific diseases and this all of us have studied in detail in our earlier years in fact if one looks at the name vitamins the name appeared from the term vita amine that is vital amine initially the vitamins which were uh, the compounds which are isolated and said to be of essential importance vital importance they were amines uh, b group and therefore the name vitamin was given but now we know that all the vitamins are not amines and they consist of a variety of structures so we need vitamins and these should be coming from our food the vitamins are classified into fat soluble vitamins and uh, water soluble vitamins the four fat soluble vitamins a d e e and k and these are found most in fats and oils of food and these are abs after absorption they enter lymph and then blood uh, protein carriers for transport they stored in the fatty tissue or liver they are not required regularly but maybe weekly or monthly because they are stored their deficiencies are slow to develop because they are stored toxicity is more likely because they are stored and that is one issue we are going to talk about similarly what are soluble vitamins it contains mainly vitamin b eight components of vitamin b and vitamin c very very essential ascorbic acid these are found in uh, watery parts of foods 
after absorption, they move directly to the blood and they're transported freely in blood. These are not stored. And these are needed more regularly compared to fat soluble uh, vitamins every one to three days because they are not stored. Deficiencies are fast to develop because they are excreted, they are not stored. Toxicity is less likely. In fact, this is what has always been the impression that uh, excess of fat soluble vitamins can cause toxicities and different diseases, whereas water soluble vitamins do not. But this is not true anymore. It's been now found that even excess of water soluble vitamins cause, uh, are the cause of number of diseases. And each vitamin has been uh, connected to some kind of disease. And this is what we call hypervitamin vitaminosis. So we shall look at some of these, uh, their structures, name, and uh, Action. First foremost, vitamin A, retinol. Now, its precursors are beta carotene and retinal ester. It's, that means it's not directly available. We know the source of beta carotene, very good source, uh, carrots. And uh, retinol is present as ester in many meat products. So, both sources, and once uh, they enter, as beta carotene or retinol, uh, retinal ester, they are converted into retinol uh, by enzymatic action. And retinol is then oxidized to retinol and connects with the redoxin and is uh, useful for the vision process. In fact, now there are two vitamin A, vitamin A1 and vitamin A2, but A1 is the major component. And hypervitaminosis of uh, vitamin A has shown problems like hypertrophy, that is bone growth, diarrhea, loss of uh, appetite at certain animals. Then coming to water soluble vitamins uh, B complex. B1 is nothing but a thymine, and thymine is a cofactor for many enzymes, as we have seen that yes, many enzymes require it cofactor and hypervitaminosis of vitamin B1 shows blocking of nerve transmission, restlessness and conversion. Vitamin B2, which is riboflavin, is a precursor for uh, FAD, that is flavin renin dinucleotide and FMN, flavin mononucleotide. And FAD is a factor for uh, cofactor for uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and succinate dehydrogenase in citric acid cycle. And FMN is the electron carrier in electron transport chain. Hypervitaminosis of B2 results in bright yellow urine, numbness, burning sensation, etc. Vitamin B3, nicotinic acid, a precursor for NAD, also known as uh, niacin. Uh, this is needed, uh, NAD plus is needed for uh, glycosis, glycolysis. Uh, NADH gets oxidized in the electron transport chain, etc. The vitaminosis or hypervitaminosis of B3 results in peptic ulcers, liver damage, skin rashes, etc. Vitamin B5 is pentothenic acid, which is needed for uh, making uh, coenzyme A. We get pentothenic acid in our diet as coenzyme A, which must be broken down to pentothenic acid to be absorbed in the intestine. We then use the pentothenic acid to make our own coenzyme A. And its hypervitaminosis results in diarrhea, etc. Vitamin B6, pyridoxine. This is a precursor for uh, pyridoxyl uh, phosphate, PLP. PLP is a covalently linked cofactor for transaminases, decarboxylases, and glycogen phosphorylase, which is a very, very uh, important enzyme. Uh, these are all called PLP dependent enzymes, and its hypervitaminosis 
results in nerve damage in limbs, reduced sensation of touch and temperature, etc. Vitamin B7, that is biotin, it's converted into activated biotin, which is used for the conversion of acetyl CoA to melonyl CoA for application in fatty acid synthesis and other functions. So, melonyl CoA is required for anabolism of uh, fats. Sometimes it's also called as vitamin H. And its hypervitaminosis results in scurfy skin. Vitamin B9 folic acid. This is required for the synthesis of glycine, methionine, uh, nucleotides, uh, thymine, and uracil. So it's very useful, B9. And it's also important for uh, rapidly dividing cells. It's uh, hypervitaminosis, results in stomach problems, skin reactions, sleep problems, and as inhibitor of hepatic alcohol dehydrase. Vitamin B12, we all know is required in very, very small amount, but very, very essential, uh, found in dairy products, milk and uh, uh, meats. Cobalamin is used in fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation in making adenosyl cobalamin and it's a cofactor for methyl melonyl mutase. Now, this methyl melonyl mutase is very useful because it is important in breaking down all chain fatty acids. See, we saw uh, in the last lecture that fatty acids are all even numbered fatty acids C12, 14, 16, 18, 20. But in nature, they are sometimes found some odd chain fatty acids, and their uh, metabolism, metabolic pathway is entirely different. For that, uh, we make use of vitamin B12 for its uh, metabolism. And its hypervitaminosis uh, results in reduction in size of vascular controlled reflexes. Vitamin C, I mean, I think this is one of the most uh, common discussed vitamin C, uh, ascorbic acid. One of the Nobel laureates, I mean, the, we all know about the person got two Nobel prizes, one for, for chemistry, uh, Linus Pauling. In fact, Linus Pauling had said that one should take uh, 500 milligram of vitamin C every day. Different requirements are uh, being proposed. And he suggested that this is a solution for all. Anyway, I mean, uh, vitamin C is very, very important. It's required for collagen synthesis and it's a cofactor for many enzymes. It's also a stranger for oxygen radicals and hence it acts as an antioxidant. People take, I mean, focus too much on ascorbic acid, and a lot has been discussed about this. Hypervitamin C, we know that if you take excess uh, vitamin C, it can cause acidification, it can cause nausea and diarrhea. So, hypervitamin C may result in acidifying you uh, uh, to acidify urea, cause nausea and diarrhea, and promotes iron overload in patients with. Thalassemia. So we should not think that uh, we should take too much excess of this. In fact, sometimes uh, unaware we are and we take one of the richest sources of uh, the most uh, richest source of vitamin C is uh, amla. Uh, so one should keep in mind taking foods in controlled amounts. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is in fact a group of uh, similar fat soluble or lipid soluble molecules and the major forms are D2, algocalciferol and D3, cholecalciferol besides D1, D4 and D5. Vitamin D3 can be obtained in the diet or derived from cholesterol in a reaction that requires UV light or sunlight. 
vitamin D is itself not active because it's a pro hormone. It is modified to yield biologically active forms such as calcitrol, and its deficiency we all know is uh, causing rickets and uh, bone loss. Nevertheless, its hypervitaminosis causes high levels of calcium and phosphorus in blood, arteries and organs, and vitamin A and B also aid parathyroid hormone in bone remineralization. And then coming lastly to the two vitamins, vitamin E and vitamin K. Vitamin E again now very often talked about and vitamin E said to be an antioxidant. In fact, vitamin E is not a pure compound. It's a mixture of eight compounds. Uh, it consists of four tocopherols, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and four tocopriinols, alpha, beta, and gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And alpha tocopherol consists of more than uh, 95% uh, component. The others are present in very, very small amount. Its role is not too clear, in fact. And uh, as far as the smaller ones are uh, components are concerned, the role is much more unclear. The suggestions about its role include a neural membrane component, antioxidant, uh, it's obtained in diet. Deficiency is rare, but deficiency is there nowadays. Uh, if you're not uh, having good, uh, you know, fat, which is having vitamin E. Hypervitaminosis of E inhibits vitamin K and therefore reduces platelet production. It also causes diarrhea, increased bleeding, and delayed healing, fatigue, and muscle weakness. So much importance has been given to vitamin E that many products, like even soaps, some soaps, not all, are sold with added vitamin E. I wonder really that a soap, which we apply for only a few seconds, you know, on our body, or maybe at the most a minute, or so are some shampoos to which vitamin A is added, how can it be absorbed so readily from these? But their costs become exorbitant only because vitamin E has been added. It may be, again, because there is so much advertisement that vitamin E is good, we start buying products without thinking that, yes, whether this will really be transferred to the body or not. And then vitamin K, it refers to phylloquinone and several structurally similar molecules. It's required for proper blood clotting. It's used in the synthesis of uh, gamma carboxyglutamate. It's a modified uh, amino acid in uh, prothrombin. Its deficiency is rare, but excess of this can cause clotting of blood. I mean, excess clotting of blood. And this may lead to thrombosis. There may be too much clotting. So vitamin K can also be bad, excess. And therefore, we should only be taking vitamins in controlled amounts. There is been so much write up on vitamin, therefore, vitamin supplements may up health risk. We also don't realize sometimes the foods that we take. Uh, for example, let's say uh, bone vita. It writes that if you take it a uh, spoonful, it meets the daily vitamin requirement. I'm just giving an example. It could be anything. Now, if daily requirement of a particular vitamin is coming from one teaspoonful of any food, that means the vitamin we may be consuming from other sources will become excess. So we may not realize many of the foods that we buy are already uh, have vitamins added to them, including oils, which we'll talk in the third lecture, that vitamins are added to these foods uh, as supplements. 
so they should not be taken and access only on the advice of a doctor the third class of minerals is uh, uh macronutrients is minerals as you know these are required in small amounts and we need seven minerals namely calcium sodium potassium magnesium phosphorus chlorine and sulfur in significant amount the others in much similar amounts the minerals are also subdivided into macro minerals and trace elements the ones which are required in more than 100 mg are called as macro minerals and these include these seven calcium sodium potassium magnesium phosphorus chlorine sulfur the others which are required less than mili, uh, 100 mg per day are called as trace elements some of them may be required in only few milligrams all these elements have different roles in the body and i am not going to talk about in detail about their roles just to mention a few we all know calcium is present as calcium phosphate in bones and teeth besides other roles chlorine is present in all cells and stomach cobalt is present in vitamin b12 copper in many enzymes iodine is a component thyroid thyroid has two hormones uh, we all know there when we go for a test of thyroid we have psh t3 and t4 t3 and t4 are released from thyroid are nothing but triiodo and tetraiodo that's why the name given is t3 and tri uh, t4 iron is part of hemoglobin magnesium is again present in all cells and bones phosphorus in atp and of course is part of calcium phosphate potassium sodium chlorine etc are uh, used as intracellular and extracellular uh, cations zinc is again component of uh, many enzymes fluoride uh, helps you know resists uh, teeth decay so all the elements minerals required in the body have specific roles in the body and may be required in uh, variable amounts according to their needs vitamin and mineral supplements therefore are usually not necessary if your diet is nutritious and well balanced therefore it's advised that each nutritious diet has have well balanced diet eat variety of foods do not uh, stick to one kind of food change foods have different type of lentils different type of vegetables uh, and so on change the oils and excess overdose of vitamins or minerals may damage your health vitamin or mineral supplements should be taken only on the advice of a healthcare provider then we come to water water is an uh, essential nutrient we all know uh, is a major component of cells and blood the human body as i said earlier is 60 to 70% of water the main role of water is to maintain an appropriate water balance to support the vital functions of the body to maintain water homeostasis intake from liquids foods and metabolism must equal losses from the kidney skin and lungs very sections of uh, water and the body fluids for this is a fundamental component tracks is a care career of uh, nutrients and waste products helps form the structure of large molecules participates in uh, various chemical reaction in the body that metabolic reactions protects key body tissues eye spinal cord and so on is a very useful lubricant and cushion around joints a uh, very important for uh, proper functioning of sense uh, senses for maintaining the blood volume and also for regulating the body temperature <clears throat> how much do we need daily again another question uh, one has to make one's own choice some questions difficult to answer uh, because different people write somebody says 1 liter 2 liter 3 liter uh i think we should only look at our requirement a need we should not be forcibly taking anything including water the amount of i mean the intake no doubt varies with age activity environment health status and diet aging does result in loss of uh thirst mechanism because of the decline in the kidney function 
because people also discuss whether it should be taken before food or uh, uh, with food. This is your discretion, one's own discretion. Kind of water, water balance uh, shown here. Uh, still, the water we take, one is the direct, which comes in the form of liquid. The liquid can be pure water. Foods. No, many foods that, in fact, even if you take tea, I mean, if you take 200 ml of tea, 98% is nothing but water. If you're taking milk, it's mostly water. Even some vegetables like watermelon, cucumber, they have so much water. Rice, how do we cook rice? Rice plus twice the uh, amount of water. So it becomes three times. That means if you're eating 300 grams of rice, means you are taking 200 gram of water. So we don't realize the water which is coming from these food sources. Then there's also what metabolic water available, which is generally small, two to 300 ml. So a lot of water comes from food. And then the liquids that we take, the water we take, the coating, soda, whatever. What is the water output? Kidneys, approximately 700 to 1400 ml. Skin, 400 to 900 ml. Lungs, 300 to 50 or 500 ml. 350 to 500 ml. And so the input is nearly equal to output. But yes, caffeine, alcohol, diuretics, uh, high protein do impact these. Dehydration, we all know, leads to problems like weakness, dizziness, nausea, etc. Coming to RO water. I mean, all of us are now taking, most of us are taking RO water. What are its advantages and disadvantages? The RO water uh, purification, we all know, involves forcing water through a semi permeable membrane, which filters out a select number of waste contaminants depending on the size of contaminants. In general, if the contaminants are larger than water molecules, those contaminants will be filtered out. If the contaminants are smaller in size, they will remain in the water. So the key health advantage, yes, uh, of RO water or tap water is that RO system removes many unhealthy contaminants, like say, arsenic, nitrates, sodium, copper, lead, many organic chemicals, and uh, also municipal, uh, municipal added, additive fluoride. These are various advantages, but it, it has disadvantages also, a few disadvantages. The WHO has conducted a study and revealed some of the health risks associated with drinking demineralized water. Now I'm coming here to the term demineralized. The water is completely demineralized and therefore some of the essential nutrients like calcium, magnesium, iron are also which are larger than water molecules, uh, sodium are also removed by the semi-permeable semi membrane. Second, the water is usually acidic. This is one of the primary reasons water is unhealthy because uh, removing the minerals makes the water acidic. And drinking acidic water does not help in maintaining a healthy pH balance in the blood. And this should be slightly alkaline. Depending on the source water and the specific RO system used, the pH of uh, RO water can be anywhere between 3 to 7. In the natural health and medical community, uh, communities, acidosis in the body, that is uh, consuming acidic water, is considered an underlying cause of most degenerative diseases. Uh, according to WHO, low mineral water is diuresis. Some also another disadvantage, some critical contaminants are not removed. As I said, smaller molecules than water are uh, retained. And therefore, I think nowadays, I mean, many uh, ROs which are coming have uh, minerals added to them. In fact, if you buy a bottle of uh, bisleri, it says with added minerals. Nowadays, uh, one gets RO which uh, new uh, 
uh, minerals. Uh, one package of minerals is also added, and these are released slowly to provide not only minerals in the body, but also to make the water slightly alkaline. And therefore, what we should be doing, we should be eating a balanced diet. And balanced diet should consist of approximately carbohydrates, 50 to 60. I mean, they, it varies. Some people say it can be up to 65%. You know, fats, 30%. Some people should be say it could be less. Uh, these various uh, people write different requirement. But nevertheless, all are equally important. And carbohydrates, as we discussed, complex carbohydrates, yes, are key. We should take carbohydrates and a major part of this should be nothing but the complex carbohydrates. Veggies, whole grains and fruits are the main source of antioxidants which work better when they come from food. So we should Rather than you know consuming antioxidants directly, we should come from foods. Nowadays, one of the uh, sources of antioxidants said to be green tea. Colored foods are also encouraged in preference to white foods, and we should avoid packaged food as far as possible. Thanks. If you have any question, uh, you can call me at. 98106 or you can email me at gmkorana1 at yahoo.co.in. Thank you.